Connie Ravikoff. We are back this week in the kitchen at Westside Local. We're going to begin our time here with their owner and manager, Brandon Strick. Brandon, thank you for inviting us back. Bonnie, thanks for having us. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the concept and then I want to get into some of the exciting changes you're implementing here at the restaurant. So the concept for Westside Local is? Here at the Westside Local, we try and serve as much local fresh produce, mm -hmm. meats, uh, steroid-free, hormone-free mm -hmm. options, um, as the name would imply. Mm -hmm. Um, we're also sort of a, a local watering hole of sorts at our bar where a lot of uh, regular guests like to come and top their evening off. And close to the Kaufman Performing Arts Center, so you're getting yes. before and after traffic we're, from that. We're very close to the Kaufman Center. We're just about four blocks west of the Kaufman Center on 17th Street. Mm -hmm. Local is who you are, what you do. You have regular dining experience in your main dining room. But on your patio, it feels like a family style. You could sit at a big picnic table and maybe get to know someone you else. Absolutely would. You get to know someone new or, or bump into friends that you didn't know were coming, and that happens all the time. How would you describe the food? Well, I would describe it as seasonal mm -hmm. and rustic. Okay. It's, um, it's definitely comfortable food. We are not on the fancier end of presentation you're going to find a meal that fills you up and makes you feel good. It's something that uh, we like to say is, is great for uh, groups of people, something that you all uh, share a bite and discuss it while you're, you're enjoying your evening. Okay, so since the last time we were here, there have been some changes. You have a new chef, but you're also doing more work with your garden. Let's talk about that. We have our own garden on site, and. That's something we've had since we opened, mm -hmm. but we've undertaken a big construction project to, uh, we're going to soon have a greenhouse on site so we can grow yes. even through the uh, fall and if it's a mild winter. Um, and uh, big expansion, we've planted some blackberry bushes, mm -hmm. um, lots of herbs on site, chard, uh, radishes, carrots, just all sorts of good stuff. And um, so you can expect more of that uh, in the future from us. So what, what am I hearing about a chef's table? Are we going to have that? Well, uh, let's not get too ahead of it. We I will, can't help, I'm excited. <laughs> we, we are in the process of, of clearing out an area and we're going to construct some outdoor furniture and have a, a chef's table in our garden Wonderful. that uh, we expect as soon as possible to uh, start taking bookings for that where it would feature as much garden produce from our own site, mm -hmm. then blended with all local ingredients and it would be um, an opportunity for the chef and perhaps the gardener to come out and talk to a table about what they're eating. Okay, I think that we should go talk to your gardener now and yeah. then to your chef and then go into the kitchen and prepare that signature dish. Excellent, thank you, Bonnie. We're continuing our chat with the chef segment here at Westside Local with their garden manager, Nicholas Garcia. Nicholas, thank you for taking time out of the garden to talk with us. Thank well, you let's talk me. about this, this is very, Exciting. What do you, so what are you growing in your garden? Well, right now uh, we have put our green leafies uh, in the garden mm -hmm. and our root vegetables, our mm -hmm. carrots, our beets, our radishes. Um, we are working on over this next week uh, getting our squash, our melons, mm -hmm. and our tomatoes mm -hmm. all in those beautiful summer fruits. All right, so you're planting seasonally mm -hmm. and you must be, I would assume you're working closely with the chef here because she is planning menus based on what's going to be harvested out. How does that work? Um, <laughs> very carefully. Carefully, well that works, that always works. <laughs> um, because uh, when, when a chef is, uh, you know, knows what they want sure. for a seasonal menu, when you put a seat in the ground, you have about two months um, at minimum before it comes out of the ground. Oh, but so, we want it right now. Yes, you yes. Planted it, where is it? <laughs> um, usually what I do um, is uh, in January or at the end of December. As That's a, when the process begins. Yes, okay. you start months before you ever put a seed in the ground. Um, I'll go through all of my seed ordering catalogs. I look through varieties that I am 
familiar with. Um, that you have some confidence in for this climate or this area? Yes, okay. yes. Okay. Um, uh, between my wife and I, we've been growing professionally for about 20 years between the two of us. Okay, so you, you go through that planning process with Chef, you decide on what you're going to plan. Indeed. You explain to her when this needs to happen and when it will and when it will harvest. Indeed. So, how exciting. I bet every you are the envy of every chef to have their own gardener growing, growing produce for their kitchen. Um, I understand that your produce is also available at area farmers markets as well as for West Side Local. So, where can we find your produce? Um, well, uh, we primarily will be at the Rosedale Farmers Market, okay. which is on Sundays from noon to three. Mm -hmm. um, and we also will be having a small sort of farmer's market table in the back of the West Side Local here on oh, Fridays nice. and Saturdays. Okay, all right. So we, we can enjoy your produce from a direct purchase as well as on the plate here Indeed. At, at West Side Local. And I think uh, what the West Side Local has to, to offer is showing, um, and I love what Nina is doing too with um, our ingredients. We tend to seek out uh, more esoteric, uh, forgotten ingredients. Thank you. Um, and Nina loves getting whatever I have to pick and bring her as it becomes available. My wife and I, what we do for the West Side Locals, we also offer uh, for Kansas City, um, we have an edible landscaping company uh, called Anti Hero. I love this. Okay. <laughs> it's anti-hero, and do you come in and help people with their planting yes, their garden? Yes, we so offer nice. consultations and you know anything from you know as rudimentary as consulting you on what you can or cannot Growing do with uh, what you've got, um, all the way to we will you know break the earth, establish the garden, and even tend it for you. So I understand that they're in the process of building a chef's table, which will be right there in the garden. You'll be, you <laughs> something you're excited about, you'll be right close to the food source. And this is wonderful. I, I commend what you're doing. I know you're devoted to organic, local, sustainable, as is the restaurant. What a beautiful match. And lucky Nina for having you. And speaking of Nina, I think we're ready to go and talk to the chef about what she's going to make with the wonderful food that you have grown and harvested. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you so much. <laughs> we continue our chat with the chef segment here at Westside Local with their executive chef. She's new to this position, Nina Gan. Nina, I'm excited to be in the kitchen with you. It's our first time. I'm excited too. Okay, so I've just talked with your gardener mm -hmm. and all the efforts he's putting forth to give you this fresh local ingredients for what you're doing. Let's talk a little bit about your journey to being executive chef. Did you always know you wanted to cook? I've always loved cooking since I was a little kid. Um, my mom always jokes that she could always find me sitting in front of the Food Channel eating crackers. Okay. <laughs> so you were fascinated she... with, with food and cooking from the time you were small. Mm -hmm. So how did you begin your professional career? Um, I actually started out doing art. I was in art school for many years. I just want you to know that several of our chefs are artists as well. This is not an uncommon combination. Yeah. So you were going to do art, okay? Yes, I did um, painting and set work, and I always loved it, but I also always loved cooking. Okay. And um, I loved using the art in the cooking to present plates in a different way, so it was like a painting. Art on and, a plate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And through that ground, I started working more in kitchens and getting more involved with things like that. And I uh, started here about two years ago. And I've just loved the place, loved the idea. I love the concept. I love working with farmers and going out in the garden and picking something and then putting it on a plate. You're so fortunate, yes. Yeah, it's really exciting. It's just a, it's a fun place where we get to play with food. Okay, so you went from art, yes. which is another creative expression, mm -hmm. to food and fell in love here at West Side Local where you had the opportunity to combine several of your interests and, if you will, talents. So what is it that you're wanting to accomplish? What inspires you every day to cook this wonderful food? 
I'm inspired by um, the ingredients. The ingredients. I like Hear to that. take beautiful fresh ingredients and not tamper with them too much. Try and show them off at in their simplicity but their own innate beauty of the ingredients. Um, especially around here, there's so many farmers just growing all of this beautiful produce. And I would rather show it off in a way where you can see it for what it is than to cook it to death. So you're also providing some leadership in the kitchen. Tell me about how that works for you with the other cooks as executive chef. I think we all work together really well. Um, it's nice to be able to have a kitchen where everyone gets along and is excited about food and everyone wants to be involved and they want to come up with something new and they come to me all the time with ideas and I'm excited about their ideas because I haven't thought of it before and we're all... Um, very team -like. Yeah, it's, team? it's very much a team. It's not really a hierarchy kitchen mm -hmm. as much as some places would be. We, we try and all work together. Everyone comes up with specials. Everyone comes up with ideas, and we're all excited about each other's thoughts. You're in a great environment to do what you do. And obviously, you are enabled to be as creative as you want to be, and we get to enjoy the food. So I think that you and I should go into the kitchen and make your signature dish. Tell us what we're going to cook today. Well, today we're going to be um, focusing on the local brewery, which is Boulevard. Mm -hmm. And we're going to be using their pale ale. Yes. And with it, we're going to take some local short ribs and smoke them and then braise them, both in the pale ale. And then we'll use them with a barbecue sauce, a roasted pepper coleslaw, oh. and some pale ale tempura onion rings. Okay, so that's the main dish. But I hear we're going to have some fun vegetables on the side. Uh -huh, yeah. And what are they going to be and how are we going to prepare them? On the side, we have some local baby vegetables mm -hmm. that we're just going to lightly steam yes. and then toss in a sweet rosemary vinaigrette, mm -hmm. which the rosemary is from our garden, of, of course. course. <laughs> and um, just present them very simply on the plate, but in a way to show off all the color and beauty of vegetables that you can just get down the street. Okay. And they were picked just probably the day before. Chef, I'm excited to get in the kitchen with you. I think you and I should go in there and make the signature dish. Okay. And I think you should come with us. We are now in the kitchen at Westside Local with their executive chef, Nina Gann. We're getting ready to make her signature dish. Nina, how do we begin? Okay, we're gonna start out, we take the short ribs. Gorgeous. Mm -hmm. Yes, they're beautiful. And we toss them very simply in some fresh parsley, yes. minced garlic, salt and pepper. And that's that's it. simple. That's Nothing simple. Else. Yeah. Okay, and we're gonna go out to the smoker and how are you going to prepare the smoker? Okay, the smoker, we're gonna put the liquid in it is water. Yes. And Boulevard Pale Ale. Okay. We're always showing it up. And then we use a little bit of hickory chip and some grape vines from our grape oh plants goodness. in the garden. Okay, and you soak them in some water first? Soak them in water, it um, helps them smoke for longer, so you get more flavor in the meat. Okay, so all that's gonna go on the bottom of the smoker, this is gonna go on top of the smoker. Right. Okay, let's go to the smoker. Okay. Okay. Okay, Nina, so we toss these short ribs with garlic and parsley, salt and pepper and they have just spent four hours in the smoker. Right. Step number two. Oh, yum. Yeah, they look beautiful. Yes, they do, actually. So now they're coming out. Mmm, -hmm. oh, the smell. And they're on a bed of carrots and onions and celery. And shallots. And shallots. And then they're going to go from here back into the oven. Yes, first we're going to take the liquid from the smoker, okay. which is um, Boulevard Pale Ale and a little bit of water. Mm. And that's what they're going to braise in. 
So in the juices in which they were smoking is what they are going to braise in. Mm -hmm. Is this like a low and slow braising? How long will they be in the oven? They're going to braise it about 320 degrees for yeah. about three hours. Okay. Oh, yum. Okay, so from here, we are going to go Right in the oven. Right into the oven. We'll top it with plastic wrap and aluminum foil to hold That's in the seed. secret. I know that secret. Okay. Okay, we pull those beautiful ribs from the smoker. They're in the oven braising, just about ready to come out. So what's the vegetable side you have here? Okay, so this is uh, just a steamed vegetable salad. It's broccolini, asparagus, green beans, radishes some beets, purple fingerlings, and baby carrots. Oh, they're gorgeous, and they've just been steamed, that's it. Very lightly steamed. Okay, this is gonna be the side. How are we getting them ready to be plated? Okay, we're simply gonna put a little bit of salt and pepper on them. Now this looks like kosher salt, yes? Kosher and salt fresh. and fresh ground black pepper. Okay, so we did that, and then tell me that looks like an exquisite vinaigrette, what's in it? It's a simple vinaigrette. It's fresh rosemary that's been very finely chopped. From the garden. From the garden. From the garden. With a little bit of white balsamic vinegar mm -hmm. and pineapple juice. Oh, yum. And brown sugar. And brown sugar. And what, did you put any oil in there? Olive oil. Olive oil. You know, we forget to use the white balsamic vinegar because it's a little bit lighter, but it still gives us some flavor. Yes. Yes, okay, so we did that. Mm -hmm. And now we're going to toss. Yep, we're just gonna give it a little shake. Pineapple juice, I'm going to do this. I, the recipes, of course, will be on the web, but mm -hmm. that pineapple juice is interesting. Sometimes people use honey. I think I would like the, the pineapple. I have to smell it, just can't okay. control myself. Oh, heavens, yeah, that does it. Yes, and then we're just gonna lightly toss them in the vinaigrette. There's not very much oil in the vinaigrette, actually. It's mostly the juice and the vinegar. So really low in fat. Yeah. Which is gonna make up for the fact that we're now going to fry those <laughs> onion, onion rings. rings. Okay, let's go fry the onion rings, and then, then we'll be ready to plate. Yep. Okay. Those beautiful short ribs are about to come out of the oven. We have just tossed freshly steamed vegetables and an exquisite vinaigrette that has pineapple juice in it. Now for the finishing touch, and that is homemade, house-made onion rings. How do we do it? Okay, it's a very simple batter. We need one egg. Yep. A um, little bit of salt and pepper. Again, that same mixture of kosher salt, fresh ground black pepper. Um, Pale ale. Okay. And just all purpose flour. Okay. We're gonna toss that in. You know, the, the beer adds that, that special texture to the crust that I think you just probably can't get any other way. Yes, it also, the yeast in the beer helps uh, to make them fluffy. Yes. And expand in the fryer a little bit. And as we mentioned when we were chatting, as much as possible, you are using locally grown and locally made products. Yes. And that's a part of what happens on the plate here at Westside Local. So you're you're going for a certain texture, and you're, you continue to add the ingredients until you, it's sort of like a pancake batter consistency. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's it's about one egg to a cup and a half of flour all right. and a bottle of beer. But I noticed that you're adding ingredients not all at once, but you're going back and forth. Do you get a better result doing that? Okay. I find that especially when working with local eggs, everyone is different. Uh, you know, I'm starting to see more and more where, especially for baking, they're weighing the ingredients rather than saying a cup of this and a and I, I suspect it's because of, of that very issue. Okay. Mm -hmm. So this is ready. Okay. Now, are these yellow onions? They look like yellow onions. They are yellow onions. And you cut them about, oh, a half an inch or so. Mm -hmm. yes. Make it a nice hearty ring. Well, we're serious about an yeah. onion ring. I mean, you don't want some skinny little whatever. 
Exactly. If you're gonna have an onion ring, you might as well enjoy it. So you put the, the um, flour on first. Mm -hmm. That gives it the batter something to stick to. Exactly. It just okay. lets them coat the ring a little bit better. So now we're just gonna get that batter on there real nice. Straight into the fryer. Now, if we were at home, and of course we're in a commercial kitchen where we're using a deep fryer. Right. But if we were at home and we heated and please put it in a Dutch oven with high sides so you don't get burned, um, would you use like a peanut oil, a non flavored sort of canola oil? or? You can use whatever your favorite frying oil is. Okay. Um, or shortening. And you just want to make sure it's at 350 degrees. 350, so use a, a candy thermometer or any kind of mm -hmm. thermometer. And you don't put a lot in at once because you're trying to maintain that 350 degree temperature. Right. Too much will lower the temperature and you won't get the same even cooking you're looking for. Okay. And once they're done, if you're doing several, can you put them on a, a baking sheet and keep them in the oven till they're all done and if so what temperature would you recommend? Absolutely. You don't want the temperature too high. Okay. So probably around 300 degrees. Okay. 250 so. even would be fine. You don't want to burn anyone's mouth. You just <laughs> want it still hot. Look how pretty. And see how they all just puff up from that beer. Yeah, the tempura batter. So essentially this is like a tempura batter recipe yes. that you'd be using. Okay. Yeah, if you didn't want to use beer, you could use club soda or a different you, type of beer would work too. So you want the you want the carbonation. The carbonation definitely gives you what you're looking for with the tempera batter. Okay. Okay, and out come the ribs. You're strong. <laughs> yeah. Spend a little bit of time in the kitchen. Okay, Chef, I always say this, but it's true. We eat with our eyes first. All the components have been prepared. Yes. How are we going to plate this feast? Okay. So okay. First, we'll plate the salad. Okay. And I like to it's exquisite. put the fingerlings right in the middle, almost like pebbles. Okay. And so we're talking about purple potatoes here. You know, yes. they always tell us to eat the rainbow, and you're making a rainbow for us. Mm -hmm. Yes. Beautiful beads. Oh. And something I forget to do, and that is steaming radishes. Yes. Yeah, They're delicious. It's a wonderful way to prepare radishes. So we forget, but you've helped us to remember that. We've got a little arrangement here. And now, if you just can't do broccoli, you could probably do this. Yes. Because it's a little less, I don't know, what would you say, powerful in flavor. Beautiful asparagus, gorgeous green beans. You're still an artist. <laughs> this isn't paint, it's food. H.A. Very beautiful. Tossing that exquisite vinaigrette. Mm -hmm. So our vegetable dish is plated. Okay. We take our coleslaw, which is green and red cabbage, mm -hmm. which is bought locally. Yes. Uh, with roasted bell peppers. Mm -hmm. And you can use your favorite coleslaw recipe. That's just the one. And you I can like. also just Grind this up in the Cuisinart yep. and you're done in, in minutes. That is a beautiful slaw. And it's you, you're wanting that fresh flavor with all the other items on your plate, and this does it. Good combo. There are those. We spent a lot of time with these short ribs in the smoker in the oven, and mm -hmm. they show it. Yeah, they get all the attention they deserve before they make it to the plate. Onion rings. Pile those on high. Yeah. And we're gonna top it with our pale ale barbecue sauce, which has a little bit of mustard in it. Mm -hmm. We use our, we started off with our house-made ketchup, um, and then the Boulevard pale ale molasses, just a rich, hearty barbecue sauce. Okay, and we're finishing this little baby off with? With some fresh cilantro. Cilantro? Yeah. Look how beautiful. All right, Chef, I think from here, we need to go to the bar, pair these exquisite dishes with some beverages, and on to our celebrity taster. 
Great. Thank you for inviting me into your kitchen. Thank you for coming. So we've just been in the kitchen with executive chef Nina Gann here at Westside Local preparing a signature dish of braised short ribs, fresh cut onion rings, a tri-colored pepper slaw, and a side of vegetables. Brandon, what should we drink with this dish? Now, you've got some flavors going on here. What do you yeah. suggest? Well, with that uh, dish, we've actually used Boulevard Pale Ale in the batter for the yes. onion rings and the braising liquid and in the barbecue sauce. Okay. That's got a lot of hoppy flavor to it. Mm -hmm. So I would suggest on a hot day, you just take a Boulevard Pilsner and sit that out Go on your it. patio with that or something. It would be nice and refreshing. It'd take away any of the heat from that barbecue sauce okay. or the air around you. So oh, okay. So definitely that's suggest option number one. All right. So also, we got that. What else? If you want a little bit more of a treat but still staying with the beer, I've got a summer shandy that I'm going to okay. make. And uh, to do that, it's really simple. Okay. We're going to take a little uh, tulip glass here. I'm going to squeeze in just one half of a lemon, fresh always, never from a bottle, Thank always you. fresh juice. That, you know, you can tell the difference when it's, you're using freshly squeezed juice. Absolutely in makes all okay. the difference. Mm, I'm uh, smelling it already. So one half a lemon. Yes. We do about two ounces of this Thatcher's ginger apple liqueur. Okay. And then I've got them poured here, but some Boulevard wheat from Draft. Interesting combination. And yes. a little Strongbow dry cider. Okay. Just lightens it up and it makes a really delicious summer cocktail with beer. Mm -hmm. Garnish with a lemon it. wheel. I there think, all right, so this is what you're suggesting to have with our signature dish. Definitely. And I know that our celebrity taster is going to have the opportunity to share what yes. he thinks about it. You told me you wanted to get the evening off with a little cocktail before dinner. What do yes, you suggest? Definitely. Well, here at the West Side Local, we, we love traditional cocktails that are making a comeback mm -hmm. that we can put our own little spin on. Okay. And one of those cocktails that's really fun right now is called a sidecar. I've heard of that. Traditionally, it's a brandy cocktail, but we're going to do it with a select rum that we've infused with a little fresh uh, rosemary from our garden. From your garden, I love so, that part. Mm -hmm. To start off, you would uh, chill down a martini glass, because this is an up cocktail. It's just some ice and water in there. Okay. I'm gonna give that a well, dump. You can also put it in, well, look at the just frost. Just gets yeah, it nice and cold. Does. Then I'm going to ah. rim the glass with a little sugar. And here we use a raw sugar. It's a turbinado sugar. Mm. Gives it a lot of flavor, some color, and it won't uh, turn to a syrup like a refined sugar does so fast. Okay. So there you go so with the that. So for that. Okay. And then we can do... Take a cocktail shaker, mm. fill it up with some ice. Yes. We've got this nice rum here. It's an EXO Reserve rum. Mm. It's lots of flavor, and we've infused mm -hmm. it. What did you, oh, you did mention with some rosemary. Garden from rosemary. The garden. Yeah. All right. Do about four ounces of that. Just a little simple syrup, which is just part sugar, part water right. that you've boiled. And that's just easy to give enough it a sweetness. just so it gets to liquid, mm -hmm. and then you're ready to go. And then another half More of a fresh. lemon. Yeah, we love the fresh. And the fresh juice. So those old flavors, the traditions from the 1920s are coming back. Definitely, and and yep. but it gives you a lot of uh, opportunity to put your own skin on something. Give it a little shake so it gets nice and cold. Shake, don't stir. Yes, for this cocktail. <laughs> yes. And then uh, with the cocktail strainer, just straining it into the glass. Ooh, what a great way to begin the evening for this signature yeah. dish. Garnishing it with some more fresh rosemary out of our garden. We don't traditionally think of herbs for our cocktails, but of course you do here at Westside Local. Yeah, they, we actually use herbs in a lot of our cocktails, and they add unique flavor to it, as well as a really aromatic burst when you first put your uh, face up to the glass. Okay, well, Brandon, thank you. We're going to go have a seat with our celebrity taster and have him taste the food and sip the beverages. Hello, I'm Bonnie Rabikoff, and we have just been in the kitchen at Westside Local with their executive chef, 
preparing a signature dish. We went to the bar with Brandon Strick. He prepared it for us, and now we've invited a celebrity taster who is a man of taste. Stephen Heinen works with Yum's The Word. I love this. Of course I would love this. And getting ready to publish your 2013 KC Best Restaurants. Yes. All right, so you you have an assignment before you, but let's talk to Chef to see what you're going to taste. Chef? Today we have a steamed vegetable salad, which is all local vegetables from Kansas City farmers. And it's just been lightly steamed and then tossed in a rosemary vinaigrette. Yum. And the main dish? And the main dish is a Boulevard Kale Ale smoked and braised mm. short rib. Uh, with a three pepper slaw and boulevard pale ale onion rings. Okay, chef, we're going to do justice to this. And you know, Brandon spent some time pairing this dish with some beverages. And Brandon, what did you choose for us? Yes, since there's a lot of pale ale already in that uh, main dish, we've paired it with a nice cool boulevard pilsner just to cut through any of the heat that that barbecue sauce brings to it. And I've also made up a summer shandy with Boulevard wheat, Strongbow cider, uh, fresh lemon juice, and a little Thatcher's apple ginger liqueur. You think you're up to this, Stephen? I am gonna do my best. Brandon, thank you. Okay, you dig in. I'm trying to be courteous and let you have the first bite. <laughs> I may or may not. Should make we start? It. Should we start with the salad? What do you? What would you like? To it do? doesn't matter. You tell me. Um, I'll I'll try the salad. First. Okay, then I, that's what I'm going to do. Oh, this is. Broccoli Rob, I believe. You know, Westside Local is very devoted to local, organic, sustainable growing, and they literally prepare from the harvest. We spoke earlier to their master gardener. Yum. Um, you know, um, oh. it was interesting. I was chatting with someone the other day, and you realize that mm. localism is not just a cool trend anymore. That no. it's it's here to stay, and people understand the importance of it, not just. Not just for the taste of the food, but for what the impact to the community. Impact to the community and nutrition. So the fresher the item, the more nutrients are retained at the time that you eat it. This vinaigrette adds the sweet and the savory all in one. It's light, it's perfect. Mm, really, this was just picked probably this morning. They are so devoted to gardening in Kansas City, not only for the restaurant, but they're supportive of young people gardening in the community as well. And I think one of the one of those things that isn't realized by people who don't buy or eat local is it really you does no taste idea. better. It tastes better. It really does taste better, but you've got you've got to try it. So you've got to try it. Well, hopefully we're convincing them. Now this meat that just fell off, I mean, I didn't even need to kind of cut it. Well, and you had a chance to see them prepare it. I so. did. We have a very devoted new chef here. Okay, I'm doing, I'm going in here. Oh. That's really flavorful. And you can taste that subtlety mm -hmm. of, of the, um, the, of the pale, pale ale, ale in there. You know, I think beer always acts as a tenderizer anyway. That sauce is amazing. Okay, I'm going in for the tri-colored pepper slaw. Because I can't hold it back anymore. <laughs> well, what a perfect slaw is that combined with. Okay, we need to do to life here. Yes, please. Cheers. Cheers. There's a lot of there's a lot of beer going on and mm -hmm. it's in it's in the batter for the onion rings and but it's not uh, it doesn't dominate. It's uh, not overwhelming. It, right. The no. minute, it's just sitting there in the background and um, okay. that's wonderful. All right, I'm I'm doing the onion ring now. Have you done the slaw yet? I've had it there right now. Oh. Oh. Wow. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. So the onion rings. You know, oh. what's, what's different about this and my other, other meals at the West Side Local is I'm, I'm actually taking a little bit more time to enjoy it. I, I tend to, to eat delicious food faster than I should. I've made myself a promise about that because truly, truly, you do enjoy it more when you eat more slowly, but it's so exciting when a flavor's good that you can't wait for the next bite to happen, and I'm, I'm conscientiously slowing down. Well, I'm trying to. Shall we, should we try the shandy? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Careful not to, uh, whatever. Cheers. Mm -hmm. Cheers. 
avoid the difference in freshly squeezed juice from the bottled stuff, huh? Well, and also we get treated because we've got the, the alcohol really bringing out that slaw and then the beer complementing the, the, uh, the, the meat. I wasn't prepared to enjoy this shandy as much as I am. That was so, fr of course, it's summer, it's getting warm. So onion rings that, you know, were freshly cut, not out of a frozen whatever. And, and you know, what else is interesting too, and you've got to see this in the kitchen, it's such a simple batter. I think a lot of times we see a dish like this, we'll say, I could never do this at home. And when you see it, it's, it's cutting some onions, you're putting together a fairly simple batter and then, and then deep frying it. Um, you don't have to be that intimidated all the time when, when you do see a, a lovely dish. So the purpose of this show is a first, of course, to celebrate the fabulous talent that we have here in the culinary world. It's also to shine a light on the efforts that are underway to use local, organic, and sustainable, but also to make cooking feel more accessible to the home cook. And of course, you're not going to always want to do it, which is why you would come here to, to West Side Local. But there are some of these dishes that you can incorporate to your repertoire of home cooking. And you're right, it, it, it doesn't have to be that complicated. It just needs to be fresh and local. Yes, I absolutely. But. OK, Stephen. I introduced you as a man of taste because of your work. Tell me a little bit about what KC Best Restaurants is about. And, and we love it that there are other people paying attention to uh, the accomplishments of our culinary world. I have people coming to Kansas City. They eat at some of our restaurants. They turn to me and say, I have no idea. Yes. I mean, Kansas City is beautiful. The arts are amazing here. Um, it's a wonderful place to bring your children up but they have no idea about the food. Well, and you know, sometimes too, not just for visitors, is the curse of the local. You know, uh, someone who, who, we are all guilty of it. We, mm -hmm. we fall into our ruts, we like our places, and, and we don't venture off to, mm -hmm. to new things. And I had the luxury of being a newcomer to Kansas City. I moved here in 2006, and I wanted to know everything about my, my new you. residence. <laughs> the mission behind our restaurant book was simply to do something on restaurants the, and, and have a standard of saying, these are the best in Kansas City. We're not just gonna say, well, it's been around for a long time, so we're gonna put them in the book. Okay, well, and, and thank you for your efforts. I think the other thing that this attention creates is we develop a new level, a new standard for what is good. When you have fresh local, when you have it prepared like this, you have a new standard for what is a good dinner. You may have a new standard. And I think this makes all of what we do better by the customers that come in and enjoy and come back. You know, West Side Local, you better make a reservation if you're coming in on Absolutely. the weekend. And Thank you for taking time out of all the work that you do here uh, and all the work you do to support the wonderful restaurants of Kansas City and being our celebrity taster. We appreciate it. I absolutely am grateful for to be chosen and thanks for having me. Okay. Hello, I'm Bonnie Rabakoff, and we are back in the cellar this week for a special series visiting the vineyard. Chris Cribb and I are visiting a new country. It is South Africa, and we are here with winemaker Michael Back from Backsburg Winery. Did I say right. that right? You've got that. I did. I got my back. Okay. So, Michael, South Africa hasn't tr traditionally, at least in the minds of America, been wine country or not until recently but you you're the third generation yeah i think the south african wine industry has been going for a long time so everyone is i think we see ourselves as being the crossroad between the new world and the old world uh -huh. We have a lot of uh, a, a lot of European influence, but uh, also kind of addressing uh, changes in winemaking style and technology uh, from uh, from the new world. From the new world. All right. So the winery dates back to 1916 when your yeah. father. My grandfather. My your grandfather. Grandfather. Yeah. My grandfather was an immigrant from uh, Lithuania. Mm -hmm. Came to the country in 1902, mm -hmm. and then he bought the property in 1916. So what, what is unique about the vineyard, the land, the climate of South Africa that makes these wines so delicious? 
Well, I think in general that uh, the, uh, the area in which we live in has probably the finest climate of the world. Ah. Certainly the finest climate to live in. Perfect. It's never... You know, I, I, I think I mentioned to you, I've been there, the weather was exquisite. No, the weather is fabulous. And I, I have mean, to say one other thing about South Africa. The air is the sweetest air I've ever breathed. Why? I, I mean, it's, it's like purified or maybe I'm just not used to air that beautiful. I, I think one of the reasons is because uh, in our area we have no mining, no heavy industry. It's a uh, it's largely an agricultural based uh, area. So um, yeah, the area is uh, so this pure place pure. is a great place to grow grapes. Yeah. So, so the environment is one of the finest in the world. And and what kind of grapes are you growing on your vineyard? We grow um, several different varieties, and uh, because you can't grow everything in one place, sure. we have. Uh, our main property, then we have um, satellite vineyards in different locations. So we go, we have, for example, Sauvignon Blanc at, uh, mm -hmm. you know, very near the coast. We have uh, Pinot Noir in uh, a very high location. Mm -hmm. So we try to uh, address the location and tie it in with the varieties. So what is unique about your winemaking? I mean, you have this beautiful climate. You're obviously maintaining the integrity of the grapes, just growing them. What what is your special care with your winemaking? I think that um, you know every, every every winery has to develop their own uh, philosophy and have to develop their own uh, persona. Um, and if people ask me what are we trying to do, then I think the answer is quite simple. We're trying to make wines which are seamless. So you should not be able to identify the different components. I'm not even really interested in talking to people about the varieties that are in the wine. I'm only interested, is the wine seamless? Does it offer you pleasure? And if it does, then I've done my job. You've done your job. So please tell me, what does seamless mean? Seamless means if you have the different components of the wine, which can be from uh, from tannins to uh, uh -huh. sugar levels to uh, um, the aromatic components that uh, they should all be in harmony so they should the sing balance. The, yeah the balance. so it's kind of sing to one note okay so your work to seamless and yeah. you have selected some wines from this fabulous wine making what do we have sure well um, South Africa does a couple grape types that uh, uh, are a little bit new to the U.S. palate, but the first is a Chenin Blanc, and uh, Chenin is a kind of a light, easy-drinking white, kind of the, the entry white. Um, it's got a nice round mouthfeel to it, um, a little bit of yeah, hints of honey to it. Um, it's just a beautiful white wine. It's the balance you were talking yeah. about. <laughs> Chenin Blanc is from uh, essentially from the Loire area in France. And uh, you can do uh, many things with uh, Chenin Blanc. You can make it into a, uh, a very serious uh, high-end wine, which is barrel fermented, and, uh, and, the, and the one end, on the other end, you can make it into a uh, more what we do, which is a lighter style, um, very fruit-driven uh, driven wine. In our case, it also has a little bit of residual sugar, because we, need, we use it as a entry to the Baxburg range of wines. Okay. Do you select sure. it for your we've, portfolio? Well, we've got, um, on the white side, we'll just kind of stay there first okay. and talk about it. We've done um, Sauvignon Blanc and Chardonnay. Yes. Um, Sauvignon Blanc and um, what we found with the, uh, there's a couple different levels. John Martin Sauvignon Blanc, which is kind of the reserve. Mm -hmm. It's very, very bright, crisp, bright wine mm -hmm. that's got um, some of that uh, time in barrel, so it's real lit, rich, mm -hmm. luscious flavors. Uh, then we're also doing a, a Sauvignon Blanc that is a little bit more in the, towards the New Zealand style. I think New Zealand... Meaning? Meaning that it's, um, I think of New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc as like a grapefruit and... Um, crisp. Very crisp. Yeah. Um, almost yes. almost puckering. Mm. Um, very, very aromatic. It's very aromatic and it's, uh, it's a style which is very well understood. Um, the uh, the reserve Sauvignon Blanc is uh, which we have uh, we we have a range which we just call in in house the mm -hmm. uh, the black label range because all the labels are black and the idea behind these wines is that they should all have either a sense of place or a sense of person 
So the reserve Sauvignon Blanc which is called John Martin because that was a man who worked for my father for close to 40 years. And it's really, what, what, what's made this wine different is um, it's a combination, it's a blend of uh, very cool climates, uh, Sauvignon Blanc from the coast and from Sauvignon Blanc grown on our own vineyards which is a slightly warm, uh, okay. warmer area. Personal place. So this is reminiscent of this very special person in all of your lives. Correct. Okay, what would place be? Place is, um, is for example, it's not uh, not here, but uh, we do a, uh, a, a Viognier, which is called Hillside. So Hillside was uh, the home of my grandparents. Mm -hmm. So, um, and so the, so the vineyard is on the hillside, but it's also dovetailed by the fact that that was the home of my grandparents. Okay. So it's reminiscent of. So I try to, uh, I try to incorporate some, uh, some history, some passion, yeah, some, 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 I, some identity into those wines. Well, you know, I, I think you can feel, taste, smell when that kind of passion and devotion happens in the bottle. Uh, well, we're doing a lot. Uh, Baxburg is doing a lot of environmental uh, projects and um, oh, good things to, to help Thank out you. the environment. Thank they're they're carbon-neutral winery. Mm -hmm. uh, Whatever we do I mean, for, you know, is voluntary. We, there's, there's no obligation to, to, do, to do the things that we do, but uh, what we're trying to do is understand what, what the consequences are of our actions in the uh, environment. And so about I don't know, six or seven years ago, we did a carbon emissions audit to understand how much CO2 uh, as a greenhouse gas we are putting up into the atmosphere, and then to try to figure out how to, how to reduce that on the one hand and how to offset it on the other hand. So if we put up one ton uh, of CO2 into the atmosphere, we will offset one ton. Mostly through a project of planting trees. It's something that's it's real. You can understand, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. um, as Michael was telling me the other day, that each of those trees that, that they plant in these uh, neighborhoods that don't have them uh. offers just a little bit of shade. It just changes the whole lifestyle. It changes the environment. It's a place for kids to play under. It's a place for kids to play in. And uh, if you're in a really small, uh, impoverished village, it uh, provides shade, and uh, which is kind of changes people's lives. We take shade just as uh, something for granted. But that, that's not always available to everybody. I, I think the beauty of what you're doing to offset is also not just in the moment, but it's something that goes on for decades when you plant a tree. It's oh, yes. years yeah, and years, yeah. for generations. But that's very nice to know. So okay. in addition to that, the um, this new series was mm -hmm. something um, I think that most Great wine entrepreneurs, I call them vin entrepreneurs. Okay, entrepreneurs. that's a good word, I like that word. Yeah. Okay. Um, are trying to do things with innovation as well. And yes. um, I know that uh, Michael's really been on that uh, that for Baxburg, and this is a brand that's called Tread Lightly. Okay. And Tread Lightly, um, if you see the bottle, is just a little bit, uh, a little bit smaller. We call it less paper. Yeah, we call it the skinny bottle. The skinny bottle. Okay. <laughs> so it's just a little bit skinny. skinnier. Okay. It's got the exact same amount of wine in it. Really. 750 milliliters, but it's made out of a PET um, hard plastic, I and it is. This. 100% recyclable. So oh and pick it up and feel how light it is. And oh my goodness. So this You is, fooled me. I thought that was glass until I touched it. No, it's as beautiful as glass. And maintaining the integrity of the wine. Yeah. Yes. So, totally maintaining the integrity of the wine. But now when we move wine around the world or within the country, we're only moving wine. We're not moving packaging. We're not moving packaging and of so, course the um, weight the weight of it and oh that's so you have less, uh, you, once again, it's driving down emissions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So pushing that, and then it also works for any occasion that you don't want to have glass at. So the Tread Lightly brand has a Sauvignon Blanc and a Merlot. So we are pretty excited about that as well. Yes. And now we can jump over to Shiraz. I know. So, <laughs> I'm so excited about the Shiraz. Okay, well, tell the, us about the, that. The Pampa Shiraz is... Uh, the sense of place uh, in respect to the Shiraz is because it's next to the pump house, which is the, <laughs> which is the, uh, which is the core. Than that, no, no, not at all. But it's the, it's the core of the, uh, it's the core and the center point of the farm. 
because out of here goes distribution of water, which is uh, really uh, the life of the uh, the life of the farm. So it kind of seems so to be. I mean, it's integral. Yes. It's uh, so it kind of needed a, a place of its own too. And uh, yeah. But so the Shiraz is the grape that we traditionally think of in Australia, but here we are in South Africa. Which how would you describe it? I think there's uh, it's. It's an integrated wine. Uh, the tannins are fairly, uh, fairly soft. Um, it's not overly, uh, not overly wooded, um, and it has uh, blackberry uh, flavors. Well, then we should taste it. Yes. Okay. I, I think okay. the Cheers. slide. Yes. Cheers. The word elegance is what. Elegant. Uh, okay, we can do elegant. I, I love the fact that the, the Shiraz has got a smooth component to it. I think that um, that shines through where. Um, a number of, it's almost like some of the more of the old world Syrah mm -hmm. than it is um, than it is some of the new world Shiraz that are a little bit so big and peppery and. So, I'm understanding better what you mean by seamless. Yeah. And I've heard this talked about before in wine. I I think this is an extraordinary example of it. I think it's very easy to use the word seamless. Um, but, but, it's no, not but it's not necessarily easy to achieve. I wouldn't think and, so. And, 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 and we can't claim to, to always achieve it, and, but you, it's, it has to but be... But it's a goal. It's it's, a, it has to be the goal, it has to be the objective. Okay, well, we're very happy that you came to America to visit us, mm -hmm. and we're equally happy that we're going to be having some of your wine here. Um, it's it's an exquisite wine. Do you want to say anything more about well, you know, the, South Africa? You did. The um, the Pinotage is another thing that we're doing with uh, with Michael that we're really excited about. What um, is that? So Pinotage is uh, is is unique to uh, it's a variety unique to South Africa. You get uh, all kinds of people in the world and all kinds of professions, but one profession is called a plant breeder, and plant okay. breeder will spend their lives trying to develop something new, whether it's a new apple tree or a new pear tree or a new, uh, new type of uh, vine. Or they, that's what they do and they spend their lives and out of tens and tens of thousands of trials and huge amount of effort, maybe one, they find one. And Pinotage is an example of the success of a okay. plant breeder's efforts in that it's a cross between Pinot Noir and Sinter. But you know, the Pinotage is, um, some people find that uh, you know it's quite uh, it's unusual. It has um, it has uh, ketones and chemicals or components which give it a very unusual okay. uh, flavor. But, um, but it's like a little bit of a sweetness to it. There's a kind of a sweetness ah. to it, and and it's been uh, working hard on seamless to get that. <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a very tricky variety to grow up on. And what would you pair and, with Pinotage? I don't know, really. I mean, you know, a lot of Pinotage is uh, sort of uh, quaffing wine, you know, where, where people will sit out on the veranda well, and... Uh, Pinot Noir has um, really, in this country, in the last couple of years, been a big sipping wine. It's been yeah. on its own. It's a, it's it's a red wine. It's a little lighter. Um, in, it's not more the red fruits instead of the dark fruits. Yeah. So the Pinotage being half that grape type yes. and half of the Cinso, uh, it, it ends up being it's a light red. it's a lifestyle yeah. wine and 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 it needs to be appreciated as a lifestyle wine and so in, on on a hot summer's day there's absolutely no reason not to chill it a little bit we got it from the horse's mouth there, I did, you know? and we did. <laughs> but, well, uh, yeah, the, the Pinotage is, a, is an interesting grape, and we've also got uh, Merlot. And yeah. I think that, you know, I um, tasted uh, two of the Merlots from Baxburg this week, and as a person that usually doesn't love Merlot, I know you don't. I, I was pretty impressed. So okay, okay. We'll, have to, we'll have to bring you up have to bring back. back Merlot down with us. I do. Expert. Well, thank you very much. We thank appreciate you very visiting much. Thank with you. you, and you're coming across the pond to yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. America. Um, and we will be back in the cellar again next week. Cheers. 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 Thanks, Michael. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.